Good afternoon to those who are attending this lecture in person at the McMullen Museum and the Conference Center at Boston College, and those who are attending this lecture virtually from North and South Americas. And good evening to those who are attending this lecture virtually from Europe, and good morning to those who are attending this lecture virtually from Asia. Thank you for being with us today. Special thanks to those sitting among us or logging in virtually who have been affiliated with and supporting the work of the REACH Institute for the, uh, for the past four decades. Friends, colleagues, benefactors, research fellows, students, and more. My name is Xiaoxin Wu, Director of Research at the REACH Institute for Chinese Western Cultural History at Boston College. Today is an important day in the 38 years of history of the REACH Institute. We're offering our very first public lecture at Boston College since the REACH Institute moved from San Francisco to Boston. To celebrate this important occasion, let me welcome Father Anthony Usler, director of the REACH Institute, to welcome you all tonight. Father Anthony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anthony Usler, and I am the director of the REACH Institute for Chinese Western Cultural History. And on behalf of Boston College and our staff, uh, Dr. Wu Xiaoxin, Director of Research, and Mr. Mark Meir, our amazing librarian and archivist. It is my privilege to welcome you th to this evening's lecture. This is the first public event, as was mentioned, since the Ricci Institute moved last fall from the University of San Francisco to Boston College. Today we come to celebrate our new affiliation with BC, and our new academic outreach here on the East Coast. Many have asked what motivated our move across the continent from the Pacific to the Atlantic coast. And on, on the West Coast, they say, why would you ever leave the West Coast? And after this winter, I might wonder. <laughs> to make a long story short, a guiding principle for us was to find ways to reach out more to graduate students, particularly doctoral and postdoctoral researchers studying the history of Christianity in China, Japan, Korea, and Vietnam. This could not have happened without the goodwill of many people and institutions. Let me just briefly mention a few of them. We're particularly grateful to Father Stephen Chao Sao Yen, former provincial superior of the Chinese province of the Society of Jesus, and the recently ordained new Bishop of Hong Kong who agreed to transfer the collections of the Ricci Institute to Boston College. We also owe a debt of gratitude to the University of San Francisco, the Institute's alma mater since its foundation in 1984 by Father Edward Malatesta. Father Paul Fitzgerald, the president of USF, graciously agreed to the move with a view to allowing us a greater scholarly outreach here in Boston. And of course, we are most grateful to Boston College and especially to Father William Leahy, the president, who so graciously and generously not only welcomed us to BC, but renovated an entire building for our use, as you have seen. So we gather here this evening with a scholarly event to welcome the local community to hear Professor Anthony Clark, who joins us from Spokane, Washington to share his unique knowledge about the church in China. It is very fitting that he do so. Professor Clark is not only an exceptional academic, but also a long-term friend, a true Lao Peng Yo, and benefactor of our institute. In fact, a part of his collections is now housed here at the Ricci Institute for the benefit of scholars. To celebrate this new beginning here at BC, we are privileged to co-sponsor this event with the U.S. Catholic China Association, whose director, Father Michael Agliardo, 
is here this evening. Father Agliardo is a professor of sociology at Santa Clara University and has joined us from California. In a moment, he will introduce Professor Clark. We also have with us Father Robert Carboneau, the archivist of the Passionist Order based in Scranton, Pennsylvania, who also teaches East Asian studies at the University of Scranton. We are most grateful that with his permission, the precious Passionist China collection was digitized by the Ricci Institute, and the physical collections will hopefully soon be housed here at Boston College. We also welcome another faithful friend of the Institute, Lauren Arnold, who came all the way from the San Francisco Bay Area for this event, as well as another old friend, another Lao Pungyo and advisor, Mr. Greg Shea, former member of the Canadian Foreign Service, who flew all the way from Nairobi via London to be here with us. Finally, I would like to thank all our friends online. I believe around 200 who have registered, who are joining us virtually from across at least three continents, from Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, Taiwan, Seoul, Hong Kong, and Tokyo, to the Philippines and Indonesia, to various cities in the UK, France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, and the Czech Republic, as well as Canada, Mexico, and from all across the United States. To all of you, thank you for being here and for supporting the Ricci Institute, and your presence is a testimony to that. Now, without further ado, I would like to ask Father Agliardo to introduce our distinguished speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father Usler. It is really a great pleasure to be here, not only for the occasion of this talk, but also on the occasion of your, shall we say, soft opening of the Ricci Institute, Ricci Institute East, uh, again, uh, here we are in Boston, which many people in the Bay Area think of fondly as the San Francisco of the East Coast. <laughs> it's very good to, uh, to be here. As again, as, uh, as Father Usler said, my name is Father Michael Agliardo. I serve as the Executive Director of the U.S.-China Catholic Association. This organization was founded by representatives of the U.S. Bishops' Conference and several religious orders in 1989 to build fraternal ties with our Catholic brothers and sisters in China. Today, the China Association also partners with Protestant organizations here in the United States in joint witness to the good news that we all share. Our website provides information about the programming that we do, and I would just like to mention a few highlights. Uh, next August, we will host our biennial international conference at DePaul University in collaboration with DePaul's Center for World Catholicism. If conditions allow, next year we also hope to resume our study tours of China. These study tours have a variety of themes and purposes, and they can be custom designed for organizations that care to learn more about faith, and Chinese culture. Again, you can find out more at our website. And recently, we published a book of photographs on China's Catholics by Liu Nan, China's premier black and white photographer. I mentioned that project in particular because we are exploring the possibility of bringing Liu Nan to the United States next year and arranging for a display of his photography in collaboration with the Ricci Institute. You may see uh, a slide or two advertising that, uh, that book and, uh, and Lunan's great work uh, as you look at the, the screens here. You know, when the, when the China Association was founded, China was reopening to the world. It was a time of renewed optimism at a time when this pandemic has shut so much down, we are desperately in need of such renewal, such opening, and such optimism. It is my honor and pleasure at this time now to welcome Dr. Anthony Clark to the podium. 
But first, a few words about Dr. Clark. He is the Edward B. Lindemann Endowed Chair Holder and Professor of Chinese History at Whitworth University. There, he teaches courses on Chinese history, culture, and literature. In 2021, Dr. Clark was elected fellow of the London Royal Historical Society. Dr. Clark's special focus is Christian history in China and the engagement between Catholic mission and Chinese culture, especially in the late Qing Dynasty. An accomplished scholar, his lengthy list of publications is too long to recapitulate here. Nonetheless, I will note several books that people here may find relevant and worthwhile. One of them is China's Saints, Catholic Martyrdom During the Qing Dynasty. This is an earlier work of Dr. Clark that explores episodes of cultural conflict and the people caught in its nexus who witnessed to the love of God in the midst of it all. Also of note is China Gothic, the Bishop of, Be of Beijing and his cathedral. This book recounts the story of Bishop Favier and Beitang, or North, North Church in Beijing, and both the cathedral and the bishop bespeak a rich history of witness in China's imperial capital. Also, I call your attention, China's Catholics in an era of transformation, observations of an outsider in quotations. This is a collection of brilliant and insightful essays on China's modern Catholic church. Before turning over the podium, I would like to add a personal note. In addition to being a brilliant and productive scholar, Dr. Clark is a member of the board of the US-China Catholic Association, and he's a gentleman. He's also a man of the church, and by that I mean not a company man, but someone committed to working with others in fellowship and a dedication to a larger vision and mission. I'm also happy to count Dr. Clark as a friend. Without further ado, I welcome him to the podium. Well, it's good to be here with old friends and, and new. As promoted, my remarks here today shall center on Jesuits and Christian dialogue with China from Matteo Ricci to Pope Francis. But I'd like to begin with a rather unexpected location and event. Hiroshima, Japan on August 6, 1945. At 8.15 a.m. on that day, the U.S. Bombardier Major Thomas Farabee released an atomic bomb named Little Boy that fell for 44.4 seconds before its detonation above the city. In 1946, in a New Yorker article, John Hersey described the appearance of the detonation as a, quote, noiseless flash that attracted the attention of those below moments before engulfing the city and its population in ruin. Just as the noiseless flash illuminated the skyline, a 39-year-old Jesuit, Father Wilhelm Kleinsorg, was sitting on his cot reading on the top floor of the three-story mission residence. Hersey recounts what happened immediately afterward. Quote, Father Kleinsorg never knew how he got out of the house. The next things he was conscious of were that he was wandering about the mission's vegetable garden in his underwear, bleeding slightly from small cuts along his left flank, that all the buildings round about had fallen down except the Jesuits' mission house, which had long before been braced and double braced by a priest named Gropper, who was terrified of earthquakes, that the day had turned dark and that Murata-san, the housekeeper, was nearby, 
crying over and over, our Lord Jesus, have pity on us. There are three things about this account that I hope you bear in mind as I shift my attention now to the Jesuits in China. First, Jesuit participation in the dialogue between Christianity and Asia has always responded to and been fashioned by the vicissitudes of historical context. China's moments of historical crisis and transformation have been no less significant to the Jesuit mission in Beijing than in Hiroshima and that it was there to the Jesuits in Japan. Second, Jesuit dialogue in Asia has retained a religious continuity while avoiding the consequences of ossification. Murata-san, the housekeeper, embodies, I think, the whole sweep of Asians who became Christian due to Jesuit dialogue. And Father Kleinsorg was so transmuted by his encounter with Japan that he became a Japanese citizen and changed his name to Makoto Takakura. Christian dialogue was often coterminous with cultural dialogue. And transformations occurred in both directions. And thirdly, Jesuits from Matteo Ricci to Pope Francis have been uniquely able to preserve the avenues of dialogue through several of China's most turbulent eras. So to state these three points more concisely, Jesuit dialogue in China has responded to historical context, conserved its religious continuity without ossification, and labored to preserve avenues of communication, especially when those avenues seemed obstructed. Today, is the 103rd anniversary of one of China's most important historical moments, the 1919 May 4th Movement, an instance of tremendous social change that transformed the contours of Sino-Western exchange. This historical incident serves as a noteworthy example of how a discrete moment in China's historical landscape can represent the inimitable Jesuit method of Christian dialogue that has remained both constant and evolving since the Society of Jesus entered China nearly four and a half centuries ago. If we are to center our attention on two Jesuits, Matteo Ricci and Jorge Mario Bergoglio, or Pope Francis, we might at first glimpse see more differences than similarities in they and how they approach Christian dialogue with China. But I suggest that these apparent differences do not represent a rupture in the society's methods, but rather really an organic development. If we take China's May 4th movement as an historical semicolon, not a, per a period or exclamation point, we can observe that for Ricci, dialogue revolved mainly around religion and culture, whereas after the May 4th movement, Jesuit dialogue revolved increasingly around politics. And if dialogue begins with speaking a mutually comprehensible language with one's interlocutor, then this transition in dialectical focus from Ricci's attention to religion to Francis's attention to politics is eminently rational and strategic. So I'll begin with some examples of Ricci's Jesuit method of Christian dialogue and shape the surface of my talk from there along the lines of how the society's approach evolved from the Ming Dynasty until the present. As I note aspects of Ricci's form of dialogue that set the tone for future encounters, I should acknowledge that he is perhaps most, what he is most famous for, I think, in China, his commitment to encouraging friendship rather than friction. While living in Nanchang, Ricci drafted a letter to the Superior General of the Society, Claudio Acquaviva, on October 13, 1596, informing his superior in Rome that, quote, last year, as an exercise, I wrote in Chinese several maxims on friendship that were selected from the best of our Western books, since they were from so varied and eminent persons, the literati of this land were astonished. And in order to lend my book more authority, I wrote a preface and presented it as a gift 
to a relative of the king. The work he mentioned in this letter was his celebrated Jiao uh, Yulun, or essay on friendship. Three key observations, I think, must be made about what Ricci asserts in this letter. First, he notes that he wrote a book, a hallowed enterprise in itself in imperial China. Second, he wrote it in a way that would appeal to China's literati, the Confucian bearers of social expectations and capital. And thirdly, Ricci presented his Chinese essay accompanied with a traditional preface outlining what brought him to compose the work. He called his preface Lima Dou Zhuan, using the character Zhuan because of its traditional patina, meaning preface or composition produced by a literatus in the classical manner. In other words, Ricci was carefully integrating himself into the context of China's Confucian culture of letters in order to enter into a dialogue based on something that both China and the West could agree upon, the importance of friendship. The paper, structure, and style of this book conformed with what China's educated elite expected of such an essay, but its contents were drawn from Western sources and represent how the world's most famous Jesuit, I think, of the 16th and 17th century, inaugurated Christian dialogue by employing the material and intellectual vestiges of 16th and 17th century Chinese Confucianism. The opening of the essay on friendship contains my own favorite line in all of Ricci's works. Or even though a friend and I are of two bodies, his heart and mine are one indeed. Now, here we can observe one of Ricci's main principles of dialogue, that within difference there remains a unity of heart between all of humanity. And, and I should add, I should add that this line in its original Chinese ends with the exclamatory ending R E, commonly used in classical Chinese prose to represent an exclamation point. Ricci wanted this assertion to be particularly clear in his essay. The earliest manifestation of Jesuit dialogue with China were not free of disagreement and tension, however. Despite the fact that people such as Ricci and his confrere, Michele Ruggieri, sought to underscore confluence rather than conflict. Both Ruggieri and Ricci were adamantly opposed to Buddhism. And Ricci expressed his criticism both in writing and verbally in debates with Buddhist intellectuals. While at the Portuguese enclave of Macau in 1582, Ricci was known to have read Alessandro Valignano's negative assessment of Buddhism, and even while wearing the Buddhist habit himself for 11 years, he shared Valignano's disdain for the teachings of the Buddha. Even in the realm of Confucianism, which many scholars have argued was Ricci's privileged domain of Sino-Western parallel, Chinese scholars have detected Jesuit misprisions, perhaps deliberate ones, in order to suggest commonalities where they perhaps did not exist. Among Ricci's strategies of dialogue was to both commend and condemn Confucianism based on chronology. He insisted that the early Confucian literati, or as he called them, Xianru, the former masters, had accepted a form of theism largely compatible with Christian belief. But Ricci also described later Confucians as Hōru, later masters, as those who had been corrupted by Buddhism and had thus rejected the early Confucian belief in a supreme god. This is figurism for those who, who uh, study uh, Jesuit history in China. Well, it was others beyond who weren't Jesuit were also figurists. There's quite a lot more I could say, I think, about, about this, but I'll simply note here that a good number of Chinese scholars have been rather critical of what they refer to as the, quote, Christianization of Confucianism. 
Li Shuzong, for example, argues that Matteo Ricci's Christian dialogue with Confucianism, quote, was reading meanings into texts rather than explaining those texts. In other words, at times, Ricci's dialogue based on cultural confluence was overly creative and resulted actually, I think, in a conflict of meaning. Now, before I discuss those Jesuits who engaged with China between the lives of Matteo Ricci and Pope Francis, I really must acknowledge Ricci's most eminent example of Sino-Christian dialogue, his very famous Tianzhu Shiyi, or the true meaning of the Lord of Heaven. The fact that this work was structured as a dialogue between a Chinese literatus and a Western scholar is a point that cannot be passed by, I think, as I discuss the society's long history of interlocution with Asia. To write and publish a, dial a dialectical exchange between interlocutors in China was among Ricci's most brilliant decisions. Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae was constructed, or was structured rather, as a dialectic, as were many other works of philosophical inquiry in the Western tradition, such as the Dialogues of Plato. In early China, the literary convention of the dialogue is represented in such esteemed Zhou Dynasty works as the Lun Yu, the Analects of Confucius, the Mengzi, Discourses of Mencius, and the Zhuangzi, or Dialogues and Anecdotes of the Taoist philosopher Zhuangzi. Scholars have said much about the ideas expressed in Ricci's Tianzhu Shiyi. But little has been said about how this text both forms a bridge between two similar cultural traditions, while also serving to prove, actually, one culture's religious correctness over another. Now, my own view of Ricci's remarkable 1603 dialogue is not without criticism. I love the text, by the way, mostly. The Tenju Shiyi represents an ingenious disquisition between Christianity and Confucianism while also usurping an imperial prerogative. Chinese imperial tradition held that only an emperor may properly distinguish religious and philosophical orthodoxy, Zheng, from heterodoxy, Xie. And in this dialogue, Ricci cleverly argues that he has discerned what authentic and orthodox Confucianism is. Pre-Neo-Confucian Confucianism, he argues, were monotheists, something no emperor of China that I have ever, uh, that I know of, would ever have accepted as Zheng or orthodox. So in any case, Ricci's Sino-Confucian interchange inaugurated a distinctly Jesuit form of Sino-Christian dialogue that was historically contextualized, decisively Christian, and deliberately structured to open an avenue of dialogue between Jesuit and Chinese intellectuals. So much has happened between Matteo Ricci's death in 1610 and the May 4th Movement in 1919, Jesuit dialogue in China during those three centuries was fraught with challenges caused by the so-called rights controversies, but also successful within the court and through the provinces as Jesuit books continued to be published, Jesuit artists left indelible imprints upon China's cultural canvas, and Jesuit churches, schools, presses, observatories, orphanages, and medical facilities emerged from China's enormous landscape. Johann Adam Schall von Bell, who served as a confidant and advisor to the Shunzhi Emperor, Ferdinand Verbiest, an astute mathematician and astronomer in the court of the Kangxi Emperor, Martino Martini, a great historian and cartographer whose maps of China were produced and sold in the West by the famous Dutch mapmaker Johan Blau, or one of my favorite Jesuits in China, Angelo Zatoli, who produced Latin textbooks of the Chinese language and canonical works. So it should be clear, I think, when enumerating this short list of Jesuits in China, that Jesuit Christian dialogue there was inseparable from science, philosophy, the arts, and the vast enterprise of book publication. Now I should say a few words about the historical context within which the Jesuits in China found themselves during the Qing dynasty. 
namely in response to a recently published book by Litzy and Sven that outlines in vivid details the actual status of court Jesuits in China during this last empire. While some scholars have referred to Jesuits in China under the Manchu, under Manchu rule as, quote, bond servants, Sven more accurately translates the Manchu term bui aha as, quote, household slaves, which is how they were described by the emperor and which is how the Jesuits themselves clearly understood their own status. The Kangxi emperor had the Jesuits managed by the imperial household. For those who know Chinese structure, political structure during the Qing, this is crucial. Rather than any other bureaucratic office, because they were, as Bui Aha, directly owned by the emperor in a master-slave relationship. Now, granted, granted, the Manchu system of slave ownership, under the system, the Jesuits received direct imperial protection and were often coveted for the high honors they received from the ruler. But it is informative that such admired Jesuits as Ludovico Buglio and Gabriel Magalhas served the court as slaves while simultaneously viewing themselves as missionaries in Christian dialogue with China. That is, Buglio and Magalhas, like Ricci before them, entered into a dialogue with China within the cultural parameters they found themselves. Ricci's language of dialogue was one of Confucian dialectic, while many later Jesuits adopted the language of service as slaves in areas such as astronomy, cartography, printing, architecture, and various other sciences. Now, one might ask how a Jesuit, quote, slave, such as the Italian court painter Giuseppe Castiglione, engaged in Christian dialogue with China while mostly occupied with fulfilling court painting commissions on subjects such as peonies, portraits, horses, falcons, and butterflies. But in Castiglione's own memoir, he describes himself as someone who, quote, all his life showed no interest in situations not involving the glory of God or the welfare of others. Castiglione's form of Christian dialogue has been elegantly described as, quote, preaching with beauty. Whatever we observe, uh, whether we observe the Christian dialogue of Matteo Ricci, based as it was upon uh, identity as a Confucian interlocutor, or the Christian dialogue of his successors who were court slaves who served the emperor in ways that preached more circuitously, Jesuit dialogue during the imperial era responded to the historical vicissitudes of emperors and imperial Chinese culture. Exchange with other religions and intellectuals was certainly the primary venue for Christian dialogue during the Qing, though science and art were also considered efficacious domains for the promulgation of the society's missionary aims. Now, one of the key lessons that Jesuits learned while serving in such proximity to China's center of power was how to adjust to the fluctuations of imperial mood, even if those fluctuations were largely caused by non-Jesuit orders and congregations. After experiencing both the so-called Edict of Toleration in 1692 and the Edict of Prohibition in 1724, the character of Jesuit religious dialogue with China was refined. The society's methods of dialogue did not remain stagnant in light of those two episodes of Sino-Christian exchange. In 1692, the Board of Rights finally agreed that Christianity could be preached legally within China, and the Kangxi Emperor issued his Edict of Toleration. This was an immense Jesuit victory within the empire, a victory that could only have come about in an environment of mutual trust and understanding. 
A memorial to Kangxi from the Board of Rights submitted on March 20th, 1692, mentions the main reasons why the court should tolerate Christianity within the empire. Quote, we have found that the Westerners sailed thousands of Li to come here to China because they admire the rule of your majesty. Now they have rendered services in compiling and editing the calendars at the same time of the wars. They diligently produced weapons and cannons. When they were dispatched to Russia, they worked trustworthily as translators. They have made quite a lot of contributions. Christian churches in different places should be kept as they are. People shall be allowed to go to churches to burn incense and to worship. Do not prohibit them. Upon the approval of these directions, let them be carried out in all the provinces." Close quote. So this astonishing argument for why Christianity should be tolerated in China was based largely upon Jesuit service to the court, particularly service in the areas of calendrics, canons, and communication. Kangxi approved these, this recommendation and disseminated his official edict of toleration just three days after that, uh, that, that rescript reached his desk. So it is important to bear in mind that the emperors during the Qing were not themselves Christian. In fact, one might refer to the Manchu line of rulers during the Qing dynasty as believers in a sort of cosmological Confucianism, wherein they were distinguished Tianzi, or the privileged sons of the cosmic deity Tian, or heaven, which was decidedly not similar to the Judeo-Christian god, or Tianzhu. And one cannot deny the Qing imperial attachment to Tibetan Buddhism. The Qianlong Emperor, for example, was believed to be an incarnation of Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom. And a famous painting of him as Manjushri among 108 Buddhist deities was produced in the workshop of the Jesuit painter Giuseppe Castiglione. Castiglione himself painted Qianlong's face onto the dramatic Buddhist tableau. So in other words, Jesuit dialogue within the court involved much more than attempting to convert by means of preaching and disputation. Kangxi's edict of toleration that allowed the continuation and proliferation of Christianity through China resulted from what some, I think, less nuanced thinkers might pejoratively call compromise. Now, while I'm, I'm not entirely aligned with all the principles of John Mearsheimer's so-called realist school of diplomatic exchange, two of his ideas apply, I think, well to Jesuit Christian dialogue in the context of China. Namely, that dialogue must, quote, work with the material at hand. And also must understand and sometimes uh, uh, hold that, quote, interests should come before values. As if echoing the Jesuit strategy of dialogue during the period between Matteo Ricci and the May 4th movement in 1919, Mearsheimer wrote that, quote, when an aggressor comes on the scene, at least one other state will eventually take direct responsibility for checking it. In other words, hardline approaches to dialogue typically result in counter-aggression, which is precisely what happened after the Jesuit strategy of careful compromise was replaced by the more uncompromising methods of those Catholic authorities who supported the prohibition of China's rights. Catholic prohibitions in China resulted in China's prohibitions against Catholicism. In 1724, in the wake of the rights controversy, the Yongzheng Emperor revoked his grandfather's edict of toleration and prohibited Christianity within China. After the crippling results of the 1724 edict against Christianity in China, the Jesuit method of Christian dialogue was even more confidently settled upon a flexible approach, one that seeks to meet one's interlocutor where she or he is, rather than shouting anathemas that end rather than encourage productive dialogue. Given 
this general Jesuit principle of dialogue upon bridges rather than shouting across shores, we are finally, I think, ready to consider the May 4th movement as a critical moment in the history of Sino-Christian dialogue. Now, scholars commonly refer to the events that inspired and followed the May 4th, May 4th 1990, 1919 as a watershed in China's shift toward modernity. Shakha Rahab describes the May 4th movement as, quote, a turning point in China's history, a moment in which modernity and enlightenment arrived in China. Seemingly pivotal moments in the history of any nation actually transpire within a larger context of social transformation. And the antecedents of 1919 reach at least back to the close of the 19th century when Western militaries again overpowered Chinese forces at the end of the Boxer Uprising in 1900. China's intellectuals, perhaps more than ever, viewed China as systemically weakened by Western incursions into its borders. So simply put, international power rather than religion occupied popular Chinese parlance. And questions about whether Christianity, Buddhism, or secular Confucianism best served social cohesion were largely out of mind. 1919 followed in the aftermath of the abolition of the imperial Confucian exams in 1905. The model of rule based on mastery of an orthodox textual canon was fading from social consciousness. A massive portion of China's population who had spent their lives breathing in the Confucian classics were generally disenfranchised in favor of what the May 4th movement heralded as the new saviors of the country, Mr. Science and Mr. Democracy. By 1919, the force of China's intellectual gravity was concerned with saving the nation and not with saving the soul. Before 1919, Chinese intellectuals, that is, those who were viewed as most empowered, those who were viewed as most empowered to serve the nation, were called du shu ren, or those who read books. There was a common saying that asserted, quote, the official, having dischar discharged his duties to serving the country, should devote his time to learning. The student, having completed his learning, should devote himself to becoming an official. By 1919, the respect for those who read books, du shu ren, had lessened, and the veneration for Confucian books and ideas that formed the mutual language between Jesuits and China could no longer be used as a common bridge. In addition to China's diminished respect for the Confucian textual tradition, what China's intellectuals once held to be the West's, quote, advanced culture, was likewise diminished after witnessing Western powers at war with each other during the First World War. From the air of China's disillusionment with Europe and the US emerged the new culture movement with such popular journals as Xin Xinyan or New Youth, which promoted communism social reform, emancipation from China's traditional patterns and science. The new culture movement, like the May 4th movement, identified, and this is important, identified politics and culture as the two legs upon which modern China stood. And by the 1920s, these ideals not only included the rejection of Confucianism, but also had identified Christianity as harmful to China's political and cultural salvation. A rash of anti-Christian protests began in the 1920s, long before the Cultural Revolution. This increasingly politicized and anti-religious climate was to define the environment in which the Jesuits offered masses, taught in schools, and continued their work as Catholic priests and brothers in China's new post-imperial reality. The May 4th movement changed how Jesuits had to engage China in dialogue. 
Between the May 4th movement in 1919 and the election of Pope Francis in 2013, China's Jesuits confronted several colossal historical events. Mao Zedong pronounced the beginning of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Foreign missionaries were exiled from China during the 1950s. The so-called Rome Independent, quote, Rome Independent Chinese Catholic Patriotic Association was established in 1957. Religion in China was pushed underground during the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. Christianity reemerged as a legally practiced religion during the 1980s. And Pope John Paul II canonized 120 martyrs of China on October 1st, 2000, a complicated date, renewing tensions between China's political leaders and the Vatican. The last Jesuit missionaries were deported from Shanghai in 1957, marking the end of the society's official presence in China. Now, of course, Jesuits have been in China through all of the events I just outlined. And even today, members of the Society of Jesus live in China, though they, they do not uh, live there as, quote, missionaries. The most famous Jesuit to have lived through the Maoist era and someone who became one of China's most influential bishops during the communist era was Bishop Jin Lushen. Jin uh, died just one month after Francis became the first pope in the Catholic Church, Jesuit pope in the Catholic Church. Now, I could say a lot about um, how Bishop Jen was an example of effective, Je an effective Jesuit interlocutor with China, China's modern government and society, but um, I'll just now turn directly to Pope Francis, who has been much in the global media because of his accord with Beijing. On September 22nd, 2018, Pope Francis signed an agreement between the Vatican and China's government that gave the Holy See the power to approve or disapprove, disapprove the election of Catholic bishops. It was the first official communication, official, between China's authorities and the Holy See since the advent of communist China more than seven decades earlier. Well, copies of the 2018 and 2020 sort of re-signing agreements remain undisclosed, the Vatican Press Office has revealed that they, quote, exclusively treat the process for the appointment of bishops and that they do not cover direct diplomatic relations between the Holy See and China, the juridical status of the Catholic Chinese church, or the relations between the clergy and the country's authority, close quote. These agreements between the Vatican and China focus more on providing, in, in a sense, freedom of religious practice. In this case, the freedom for China's Catholics to have bishops in full communion with the Pope, than on providing a platform for discussing political, or for a platform for discussing religious belief. Both of these agreements align with the Jesuit method of dialogue with China that began with Matteo Ricci. Ricci in the late 17th century had the same basic principles of dialogue. In 2017, one year before Pope Francis signed the first agreement, a Jesuit confrere of the Pope, Father Joseph Jiang, published an essay in La Civil Civilta Catholica entitled Catholicism in 21st Century China that unmistakably expresses the Jesuit method of Christian dialogue with China. And even more, it clearly describes the rationale behind the 2018 agreement. Zhang wrote, quote, because China is so different from the rest of the world, the Chinese Catholic Church needs to learn how to deal with the local culture and political authority in other words, while keeping its Catholic identity, the church has to establish a, quote, Chinese Catholic church with Chinese characteristics. If it is to enculturate church teachings and gospel values that are relevant to the Chinese people and serve both their own and Catholic spiritual needs. So note how well Zhang's assessment conforms to the three elements of Jesuit China dialogue that I articulated at the beginning of my talk. First, 
he responds to China's new post-May 4th historical context. He even explicitly mentions the movement's two legs of reform, culture and politics. Second, he insists upon the need for China's church to keep its Catholic identity, but not in an ineffectively ossified manner. He astutely borrows, astutely borrows from China's party terminology, recommending a church with, quote, Chinese characteristics. And thirdly, Zhang promotes a form of exchange that is relevant to both Christians and non-Christians, thus suggesting a way to keep the avenues of dialogue open between the church and the political authorities in Beijing, as if to echo the diplomatic wisdom of Mearsheimer's realist school, Zhang also states that while maintaining its Catholic faith and identity, quote, the Chinese Catholic Church will have to redefine its role and relationship with the party and its ideological theories. This does not necessarily mean that the church has to agree completely with party politics and values, but it must find flexible and effective ways to continue its mission and ministry in China. Now, one can actually read between these lines several historical antecedents. The Edict of Toleration, the Edict of Prohibition, the Rights Controversies, and the May 4th Movement. Whatever criticisms of the Pope's two provisional agreements one might find in the media, both agreements and Joseph Zhang's 2017 essay display cohesive alignment with the Jesuit method of Christian dialogue with China since the late Ming. So I just am not far from the end. Now, so as I move toward a conclusion, I'd like to briefly address how the media has responded to Pope Francis' approach to China. Most media commentary on the Sino-Vatican agreements of 2018 and 2020 and on the Pope's public statements related to China have been rather polarized. In both the secular and Catholic media, opinions of Pope Francis's dialogue with China are predictable. He is either depicted as he's depicted as either betraying the church in China or as overly cautious in his negotiations. He either goes too far or not far enough. So one recent media criticism is uh, that the Pope has not sufficiently asserted his opposition to issues related to human rights uh, violations and. Of, of religious liberty uh, in the People's Republic of China. Despite the ideological polarization one sees in the media, Pope Francis continues to do, I think, what Jesuits have done since the era of Francis Xavier and Matteo Ricci. He views Christian dialogue as a long-term project that is most effective when it is historically grounded, faithful to its religious aims, and preserves the avenues of communication. Now, in just the last two years, I think, a spate of articles about the Vatican's dialogue have appeared, each one either snubbing or supporting the Holy See's engagement with China's government. One 2020 dispatch in the Vatican News explained that the Sino-Vatican agreement only regards, quote, the process for the appointment of bishops and continues to clarify that its aims is to permit the Catholic faithful to have bishops in full communion with the successor of Peter. This is complicated, but let me say it. Two years later, this is the ecclesial reality in China, a reality that Chinese Catholics have not had for 70 years. Another article published by the Catholic News Agency during the same year is critical of the agreement, suggesting that the Holy See should not sign an accord with a government that disallows children under the age of 18 to attend Holy Mass, monitors church activities with state-installed cameras, imprisons clergy, and subjects the Xinjiang Muslim population to policies that have been condemned in global news sources. The article does, however, acknowledge Vatican, the, uh, acknowledged Vatican Secretary of State Cardinal Pietro Parolin's response that the goal of the agreement is, quote, unity of the church and not to address the many other problems that the agreement was not intended to solve, close quote. Now, and a, a Reuters article published in 2021 attempted to represent Pope Francis's view on why he signed the agreements. Uh, the report is entitled, quote, 
Pope defends deal with China, says dialogue necessary. It's an interesting article title. And succinctly summarizes the Pope's justification as, quote, an uneasy dialogue is better than no dialogue at all. In an interview with the Spanish uh, radio network, Pope Francis stated with equal uh, conciseness that, quote, China is not easy, but I am convinced that we should not give up the dialogue, close quote. So now looking back on the long historical Jesuit experience of dialogue with China, one can easily imagine these precise words uttered by uh, Matteo Ricci. By considering Jesuits and Christian dialogue with China across the long durée, one better understands the continuity between Matteo Ricci and Pope Francis. Historical context, an agile commitment to Catholic belief, and a determination to maintain open communication are as active in the contemporary Je Jesuit dialogue with China as they were during the Ming and Qing dynasties. So I'll end here by expressing my gratitude for both the US-China Catholic Association and the Ricci Institute here at Boston College. I'm here today at their kind invitation, but I'd like to acknowledge I'd like to acknowledge primarily how these organizations continue to encourage the kind of dialogue embodied by the Jesuits I've just mentioned. The US Catholic, the US China Catholic Association has had directors from such Catholic orders as the Mary Knowles and the Passionists, but presently its director is a Jesuit, as is the director of the Ricci Institute, the attention that the USCCA, Ricci Institute, and indeed Boston College have given to dialogue is remarkable. I'll conclude with two quotes, one by Ignatius of Loyola and another by his successor of this, in the Society of Jesus, Pope Francis. Ignatius' spiritual exercises begin with one of his most eminent uh, 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 assertions in all of his, his writings, the famous presupposition. He wrote, quote, every good Christian ought to be more willing to give a good interpretation to the statement of another than to simply condemn it. And since I began my talk with a Jesuit in Japan, I'll end with a quote from Pope Francis to a group of Japanese students visiting Rome in 2021. Francis said, quote, all wars, all struggles, all problems that are not resolved with which we face are due to a lack of dialogue. So I'll end there, and I am grateful to your, for your attention. Thank you. I uh, really am going to take a day or two to let all of that soak in, and I'm familiar with many of the terms and uh, episodes that you've mentioned. It was a very rich talk, uh, but I won't comment on that. I'm going to invite uh, Father John Chen uh, to offer a few brief remarks uh, and reflections. Uh, Father Chen is an old friend of mine. We studied here uh, both preparing for priesthood some 30 years ago, and so I'm very happy uh, to be able to invite this old friend to the podium. Uh, but he's also very accomplished uh, in his own right. He's uh, served as the rector of the National Seminary in China and vice secretary general of the Chinese Catholic Bishops Conference. Uh, he's no stranger to these parts, as I mentioned. Uh, not only did he earn his Master's of Divinity here at St. John Seminary, but he earned his doctorate of higher education at Boston College. Um, his Chinese name is Chen Shujie, uh, the S, initials SJ. He's a, a wannabe Jesuit. Um, but uh, uh, I will also note, uh, as, as any good Jesuit, um, he is a poker player and will be playing on Friday. Anybody else interested in a good game, let me know. Uh, anyway, without further ado, uh, Father Chen.
Thank you, Father Michael. We've been friends, well, as Jesuits, you can never have any true friends, right? <laughs> uh, we've been friends for 30 some years. The moment I came to the States to go to the conference for the first USCCB then, not USCCA, Father Michael uh, took me there to participate. So all these years we've, we've been walking together along the path that uh, Jesus prepared for us. And I did try to become a Jesuit, but the first time, one Jesuit priest here at Boston College, Father Ed O'Flaherty, and who was the uh, spiritual director here at uh, Archdiocese of Boston, he told me, he said, John, going back to China to work is doing the work of a Jesuit. So with his words, I went back to China to, to work. And the second time I tried to be a Jesuit, and a very dear friend of mine also a Jesuit said, Father Chen, you are too old. <laughs> but anyway, I'm here in Boston, and uh, as a pastor at St. Julia Parish in Winchester. So whenever you have time, come to visit. Many people call it uh, Eucalelia. That's the parish. But it's a great honor to be here at this moment. Father Michael told me to speak only two or three minutes, probably already two minutes, and I would do my best. Uh, dialogue has always been the most important thing for us, uh, the church, dealing with the church in China. After spending 10 years in the seminary and the bishop's conference, I really learned the importance of engaging a dialogue. Being the rector of the National Seminary, many of you might know well, is National Seminary being sponsored by, well, sanctioned by the government. is not a true Catholic seminary. And many, many people certainly reluctant to come to visit. And my saying then was to use the John's Gospel, come and see, then stay. Three Verbs would describe the whole, I would say, the entire Gospel of John. Come, see, and stay. So at my invitation, many, many non-Chinese from the U.S., from Germany, from Europe, and all those countries, and came to see and to teach. So by being working together, the seminary became very different. And today, on this topic of dialogue with, uh, from Richie to uh, to Francis, I've been inspired a lot. First of all, when I was studying uh, at Boston College to get my doctorate, I studied on the history of the Catholic higher education in China. The Jesuits, I came to learn a lot. So Matteo Ricci went there to start with this, with dialogue. So he himself, as a Jesuit, as a churchman, and the Chinese government, then the, the the emperor came together to understand, to come to a mutual understanding of faith and culture, to build up the friendship, as you said. Friendship in China is so important. You become a friend, you can go anywhere you want to. You can do anything you would like to, from the old times until now. To become a friend of a Chinese, you're always Chinese, you're always a friend. Once you become an enemy, then, then that's it. <laughs> you have nowhere to go to. And throughout the centuries, the Jesuits really tried very hard to be there. And over the years, the Jesuits had two universities in China, certainly Jesuit universities. Don't forget, there is a Catholic university in Beijing. Uh, that Catholic university called Fulton University uh, was sponsored first by the Benedictines, later by the SV, German SVDs, and it became so well-known university in China. So all these missionaries, especially the Jesuits, they kept the dialogue, the dialogue with the culture and with the local people to help the people to understand the faith within the context of the real culture. Then later, when the Cultural Revolution started, when the last Jesuits were spelled, not only the Jesuits, and all the missionaries were expelled, and 
the local Chinese Jesuits, local any missionaries, religious order priests, and also the Taoist priests were imprisoned. So no one could do anything. Then dialogue stopped. So in China, the dialogue between the government and the missionaries and all the people, you have to take some risks. If the government closes the mouth, then nothing goes anywhere, right? Or, or goes nowhere at all. So then that's it. So after the Cultural Revolution, Beijing government suppressed everything, no schools and no churches, nothing. So once there was no conversation, no dialogue, there was no life. But certainly God works miracles. For 10 years, maybe 30 some years, the church was closed, but the Catholic faith remained. The seeds of dialogue, the seeds of faith just grow sacredly. So then in 1982, Deng Xiaoping, came, well, 1980, Deng Xiaoping came to power. 1982, the first Jesuit, Aloysius Jane, opened the seminary with only six books. He recruited a few Jesuits, came out from prison, prisons, they opened the seminary in Shanghai, became the, first, the best one in China over some years. And Jane used the same technique to dialogue with the government to find out how much room he would have in order to train the priests. Thanks, thank God, I was one of the students in Shanghai. And I was one of the first of four who came to this country to study in the seminaries. So two Johns came to St. John Seminary. I spent 10 years on this property. And I know this area very well. It used to be Cardinal's residence. I came in here a few times to meet the Cardinal, to talk about my future, to attend masses. And I'm here today, and I suggested a place to talk about dialogue. Francis certainly keeps this door open. He knows the government from more was very different than others, Deng Xiaoping, Hu Jintao, Jiang Zemin, all those ones. They were a little open. They kept also the door open so the church could grow. Now Xi Jinping is very different. It's very, very different. But we have to find our ways to continue our mission. The door to China can never be closed. It never be closed. So 10 years working in China, I felt the pressure. Without a dialogue, with outside the culture, with outside China, was not easy at all. So friends, do the best, be inspired by Dr. Clark, and we do the best to help the church. As one of the uh, directors of the board of USCCA, I'm at the invitation of Father Michael, I'm so proud that we have this day to listen, to be inspired, and to pray more so that we can do more to help our brothers and sisters in China who are still trying to walk with Jesus. Not easy, but they are determined to walk the path that the Jesuits really prepared. Thank you very much. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Clark, for that uh, inspiring presentation. And thank you, Father Michael, and Father Anthony, and uh, Father John, uh, for your um, remarks. And, um, and again, for those who logged in virtually from Asia, and good morning. And for those who logged in from Americas, both North and South, good evening. And for those who have logged in from Europe, good night. <laughs>